Hi, you're listening to Irish Stew, the podcast for the global Irish nation. I'm Martin Nutty, and together with my co-host, John Lee, we're working to bring all the Irish together, whether you're hyphenated or not. We'll be talking to Irish people of excellence about their lives, what they do, their successes and failures, and how they relate to that small green rock off the coast of Europe. If you like what we're doing in this space, please remember to subscribe to Irish Stew, and even better, leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Hey, it's uh, Martin Nutty, and you're listening to Irish Stew, the podcast for the global Irish nation. I'm here solo this week, as my colleague John Lee is away on vacation. And so it'll just be me and my guest. And I'm delighted to have Ashling McReynolds on the show today. Ashling is the Chief Business and Growth Officer of Cynic, which is a Silicon Valley company operating in the technology security space. And uh, actually, I've known Ashling for quite a long time, but we haven't spoken recently. We do have one thing in common. We are members of something called the Irish Pipeline. And uh, maybe we'll go into that a little bit later. But I'm going to bring Ashley in. Ashley, How are you, Martin? Welcome. Thanks a million. When did we last speak or when did we last see each other, Martin? I will tell you exactly when that was in. You have a better memory than I do then. (laughs) It was in JFK Airport. And we were heading back to college. You, I believe, were going Ah. to Mount St. Mary's and I was going back to St. John's in New York. And uh, we got stuck on a very long immigration line. Oh, God. Now, yeah. The, now that you say that, I do remember it. Jeez, that was probably in 85, 86. Thereabouts, yeah. And uh, I had to pay for your ticket down to Maryland. <laughs> God, I hope I paid you back. <laughs> if not, you're yeah. getting paid now. <laughs> yeah. It's no Venmo, no cell phones, nothing. <laughs> You sent me some cold, hard cash in the mail. Did I put it in tinfoil? That's what mom always does when she's sending money over here to the kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, no tinfoil, but it, but it did arrive. <laughs> but it made it. Yeah. And, that, and, and that was the last, the last contact back in the, the 1980s. So it's, it's great to reconnect. Absolutely. Uh, and it's interesting because when you reached out to me, you would swear it hadn't been that long, right? You, it, with technology and everything today, you were able to just reach out and say hello and rekindle old times as if nothing had changed and of course uh you know well your name has changed but mine is mine is still pretty easy to find uh so but let me ask you this um if you were to kind of uh explain cynic i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing that right is it you are, actually yeah okay. cynic so if you were to explain cynic how would you describe it to non-techie folk <laughs> So uh, Synac is a uh, startup, uh, kind of a mature startup, what we'd say is Series D, which means we've taken uh, four rounds of funding, basically about 200 employees, and we are in the cybersecurity space. So we, what we do is we actually crowdsource hackers, ethical hackers from uh, around the world. We have hackers from over 80 different countries. And we use those ethical hackers to attack digital assets. And by that, I mean websites, mobile applications, and the infrastructure behind all of that that supports it. We go in and we attack these digital assets to try and find vulnerabilities. And basically, the goal is to beat the bad guys to this stuff. So whether you're working at one of the large banks in New York or one of the federal agencies, uh, one of the food delivery services in Europe, we will actually go in and hack those applications to try and find vulnerabilities that could shut down the application or could uh, have people's data stolen. We find that we report it to the company or to the institution. We give them a lot of insight into all of the steps that the hackers took in order to be able to break in, if you will, and The goal is then that that organization can fix that vulnerability and we'll test it for them to make sure it's actually patched and then keep that application up and keep everyone's data safe and keep the business running. So that gives you an idea of what we do. It's it's a fun space because it is, you know, crowdsourcing in general, the whole gig economy is a very fun space. Okay, let me tease that apart a little bit. So first of all, 
I'm guessing that anytime you have a major hacking event, uh, you know, where somebody gets, you know, 100,000 social security numbers stolen, mm-hmm. your phone is likely to start ringing. Do you see a correlation <laughs> between those kind of events? If I do my job right, Martin, the phone rings a long time before then. You know, if, <laughs> if, a, if a hacking event happens, uh, that would be a very bad thing. None of my customers over the last five years since we started the company, none of our customers have actually uh, been on the front page of, of, of the Wall Street Journal or of, of uh, the London Times or anything like that. None of them have had a big hacking event because we're proactively going in and finding the vulnerability. So it's more as you're developing the code and launching that code and updating it, we're testing it early in the process so that a hacking event does not happen. I was thinking more in terms of uh, prospective customers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is no. So if, if a bank gets hacked, yes, our phone rings with lots of other banks. And, you know, same thing. If a pizza delivery firm was to be hacked, um, we're well known for some of the business we do with companies like Domino's, et cetera. And so, yeah, if one of, if one of the others got hacked, everyone would ring us. Um, but like I said, uh, yeah, definitely being proactive. Mm-hmm. Now, I note your title uh, is uh, Chief Business and Growth Officer, CBGO. Like a, <laughs> like Do you want to acronymize it? Yeah. <laughs> what exactly does that look like? God know? knows. <laughs> And it's and, we, and you and I grew up a long way from CBGOs. <laughs> Honestly, I, I've been involved since the very beginning. Um, uh, I started as an advisor with this this company when it was just two founders who had left the NSA. They were hackers at the NSA, and mm-hmm. uh, they left and came out to Silicon Valley. And uh, the key investor, Kleiner Perkins, uh, the chairman there, called me and asked if I would come in and help them. And when I said, "What do they need help with?" he said. Honestly, Ashling, everything. And so I started, the three of us were sitting in the basement of Kleiner, really mapping out the business and what we wanted to be. And something for anyone who's in startups, something very important to what we didn't want to be, always very important when you have that vision of a business you're building, because uh, it's so easy to get taken in different directions. And so to a great extent, since the very beginning, Martin, I was involved in driving the overall strategy of the business deciding what we would stand for, what the products would look like with the founders deciding, you know, what the products would look like, and then creating the marketing, the product marketing and the go-to-market around that. So I also have purview over making sure we're aligned right through engineering, product, operations, marketing, et cetera. So I kind of play that overall business role. Okay. So let's just kind of... uh step back a little bit and go back to JFK in the mid 1980s. <laughs> you are heading to Mount St. Mary's and I know you fetched up in Duke at some point, but talk to me a little bit, you know, elevator pitch style about that journey. How do you go from being a young Irish woman on athletic scholarship in America to tech land? in Silicon Valley as a C-suite executive? Yeah. That's just a small question, you know. (laughs) Yeah, just a small one, elevator style. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, how did I even get over to America at one level, Martin? You know, it was all, you know, at some level, I think back then we were all driven by two things that I think of very strongly in my life. At, At one level, we had a need Right. We had a desire and need for survival and, and to be able to find ways to thrive and be successful. Times were very different back then at home. And so thing, you know, I think a lot of us were looking for challenges and, and ways that we could ex- succeed. I think the second thing, in all honesty, that we had was absolute stupid naivety. And so in, t- <laughs> in general, when I look back, I mean, I think, and often nowadays when I do speak with graduate students, et cetera, you know, I always think it was great that we had no clue what we couldn't do. You know, when I roll the clock back growing up in uh, Greystones, Castle Bar and then in Greystones, um, surrounded by amazing people, but quite honestly, like I didn't even know women who who worked outside the home other than maybe teaching, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole idea of a C, a chief anything, was just language that I had no understanding of. And so in a, in a way, I thought that helped greatly because when I came over and I took the athletic scholarship that was offered to me, 
again, probably a stupid thing that I was naive on, but I said yes and came over. And I think then you just day by day, you grab on to opportunities as they happen. And, you know, for me, in all honesty, getting a visa to stay in America um, once I graduated from the Mount was quite challenging. Uh, it wasn't a school where there was a huge amount of recruiting going on. And if you remember, you probably had the same process. There was a very limited number of jobs that we could qualify for on that J visa, that one year you had on the J visa. Remember, it was from May 24th, uh, 1988 until May 24th, 1989. Yep. <laughs> and I had to, to get a job. And in and I what I did was I actually found the highest per capita town in that I could find, it was in uh, Marblehead, that loved the Irish. So a town in Boston, they loved the Irish, loads of people making a decent living. And I went there and I became a bartender. (laughs) (laughs) It's what I could do. (laughs) That's a long way from uh, Techland. (laughs) Absolutely. What I did was then I had to find someone who would become an advocate for me because I didn't have a lot of contacts here. So finding someone who had an advocate to get me a job somewhere like a management consulting firm that could get my H visa. And so that's what I did, uh, bartended till I found the right people and uh, they did advocate and, and I did. It was I was cutting it close. I met this person who helped me out. I met him on Easter Sunday. So I only had until until May 24th. And so it was Easter Sunday and uh, got a job as a management consultant. And that really started my business career. So I know it's not a perfect answer. That started my business career. I did a few years of management consulting I actually headed off to, they sent me to Asia, spent most of my time working on the Pacific Rim, uh, doing M&A work for them. And when I came back, then I joined uh, a partner who was starting a, he was working, he was becoming CEO of of a biotech firm in North Carolina. And again, just as when the coach had called me and said, would you consider, you know, taking an athletic scholarship and coming to America? When this fellow said, would you consider becoming a product marketing person at this startup in biotech. I was totally clueless. I didn't know what biotech was. I didn't know what marketing was, but I said, sure. I didn't even know where North Carolina was, <laughs> um, but I said, sure. And uh, I went in and, uh, and started. And so that was my first startup. Um, and, you know, I caught the, I think the entrepreneurship bug, if you will, there got to really love the opportunity of being able to start something and build something and create it. And it felt like anything was possible. Um, I went back to Duke at the same time while I was still at the startup and did my MBA just because it was, it was nearby, um, did my MBA. And then when I got done, the yank I had picked up along the way said uh, he really wanted to go to Stanford to do his MBA. And honestly, I was at that point, I begged him not to. I said, why can't we stay on the East Coast? California is too far from home. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, just give me two years. So clearly, I'm not a woman of conviction (laughs) because I, uh, I caved easily. We came out, we drove across country. We said we would spend two years. And I live about 200 feet now from where we moved in that night um, when we moved here as students. So, so you've put down uh, deep, unexpected roots in California. Yeah, absolutely, and, and as you say, totally unexpected. But the truth of the matter was, you know, even back then, the opportunities, let's say, back in Ireland, were, as far as I was concerned, virtually non-existent. The Celtic Tiger was not a dream in anybody's eye at that point in time. That's right. And so. Remaining in America at that point in time was probably the only viable thing. And of course, when you form a family, etc., it becomes much more difficult to kind of cut that cord and you start making friends and you get established. So let me ask you this question. How do you describe yourself in terms of your Irishness? Are you Irish-American, Irish-Irish, uh, American, or, you know, where does the hyphen fit? Yeah. It's a great and very annoying question. <laughs> um, I think it's it's a hard question for because one, if I go back to what you just said, I know I didn't. I you probably didn't either. I'm not sure there was ever a time where we said I'm going to move to America and I'm going to become an American. Mm-hmm. I don't think that was part of our language back then. I think you were probably similar to me. We said yes. I, I know when I came first, I thought oh, I'll go for a year 
and then I'll go home. And then, you know, I thought I'll, I'll do the degree. And then I thought I'll get a little bit of experience because then I'll go home. So I think going home, being Irish was always number one. I always thought I was going home. And in fact, uh, you know, when I, when I did meet the fellow that I married, um, I fought it for a long time. I, I really didn't want to become an American. I didn't ever, like, I didn't plan on staying. And so very hard to put the hyphen in when you didn't calculatedly do so, you know, when you didn't think about it and when your goal was to always go home. Um, because I thought it was opening, you know, I thought I was, was turning a new page in a book and instead you were starting probably a whole new book, not just a new chapter. And so, you know, at some point, and I know it's a, a long answer to your question, but at some point, I think I had to come to terms with the fact that I was very happy here and that I had built a life and that I was enjoying that life. Um, and then, and it was hard. I'd, like I'd love to know for you, but it, it was hard to kind of feel like, I guess I'm an American at some point. You know, it's still very hard for me to say those words because mentally the hyphen is probably in a different place than it is in my physical life. In my physical life, I very much live in America and I very much enjoy my life here where I live for the most part. But mentally and emotionally, it's still, I like to think of myself very much as Irish. So let me ask you this. How much contact do you still maintain with Ireland? It sounds like your, your mom's still around, obviously. Yeah. So um, is that something you try and visit regularly or is it? You know, at first I did. And then what I found was as my life got complicated with children, etc., it was easier for my parents to come here. And they really enjoyed coming here to, to uh, California, whether it was the weather or they got kind of used to the visits and the lifestyle. And so mom and dad used to come regularly and, and often stay two to three months. So they would spend a lot of time. That was wonderful. It, it did unfortunately mean that I stopped going back mm -hmm. and went back less and less. And so it, it then became, mom doesn't necessarily come for three months anymore. She, she comes for, you know, maybe a month at a time until obviously the pandemic has changed that. But for the most part, she would come every year for three weeks to a month or every eight, nine months for three weeks to a month. Um, so we feel very blessed and very lucky that she can spend that time here. I then unfortunately though, tend to go home. If I have business in Europe, I'll stop off. It never, it's never for as long as, as I'd probably like, or as it probably should be. I visit, um, but not, I, I, I rarely get to spend an awful lot of time there. I'm very blessed. I have friends from home and we are all on WhatsApp together. And so I cherish the fact that I still get to chat with my friends from Greystones on an ongoing, regular basis. And that's really important to me. Excellent. So kind of, Taking that angle a little bit, um, how robust is the Irish presence in Silicon Valley itself? And is that something that you actively tap into or seek out? Um, it's completely different than the East Coast, in my opinion. You know, when I did work in Boston, you really felt like you were still part of an Irish community in Boston. And I think you probably have the same thing in New York, Martin. Yeah. Um, North Carolina was not like that, not a huge Irish population in North Carolina. And I have to say, although it's a beautiful state and there's a lot of things going for it and I enjoyed my time there, it made me uncomfortable because I didn't feel there was a, a strong Irish population or a strong European culture in any way. What I found in California is it's so different than the East Coast. There's really, there really aren't the same pockets of culture in general that you find on the East Coast. Um, you know, in Boston, I always felt like you could be loved because you were Irish. You could be, you know, you could be a mass murderer. I often say they'd still love you um, because you were Irish. Not, I'm kidding, but you know, there was definitely an acceptance. You almost feel out here, nobody cares where you're from. And there's a good and a bad that goes with that. Um, it certainly means when you get here, there's no Irish community just waiting to accept you and waiting to help you fit in. I think out here very much you have to create the terms in which you fit in yourself. You have to uh, seek it out. And 
so, you know, I certainly enjoy uh, some of the Irish community out here, but I wouldn't say that it's it's a very strong part of my life out here. I cling a bit more to the Irish community at home than I do here in California. Okay. So just kind of switching back more to the business end of things. I see when you moved uh, out to California, you fetched up with some microsystems and seemed to have spent quite a long time there, probably right up to the point where Sun was folded into Oracle. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, I, I guess uh, back when you started then, Sun was this like really dominant force in the space and then seemed to kind of fade away a bit. I, I guess their their lunch got eaten or their cheese got eaten. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's sadly a bit of the way things go. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I, when I arrived in Silicon Valley, again, it was so that my husband could uh, go to Stanford Business School. And uh, we didn't know anybody out here. Um, I was going to be the what I like to say is the benefits in the family, the benefits and the salary. Yeah. Um, and he was going to be a student. And so I had to build a community around me and there wasn't a great Irish community to tap in the heart of Silicon Valley. It was a bit better up in San Francisco, but not necessarily down around Stanford at the time. And so I did research and needed to find a company where I felt I could learn a lot. My goal at the time was to learn about technology. I had done biotech, I'd done management consulting. I could barely turn on a computer, to be honest. So I knew nothing about tech. But when I did research, I realized that Sun Microsystems, as you say, was a very exciting company at the time. It was in the very early days, right before Java, when it was in its nascent stages. And so everything pointed to the fact that I wanted to join Sun and learn technology from being part of something that was very cool. Now, I have to say that was great on paper. When I uh, interviewed and tried to get a job at Sun, they slammed the door in my face. And I literally remember one of the HR people saying to me at the time, we will never hire you. Uh, you're, you absolutely have no value to us. You have no benefit. Um, and because the value is an extremely, and still is to a great extent, but even more so than very technically snobby place. You really, you know, for the most part, needed to be a computer engineer to get um, in at these companies. And if you didn't have a technology degree, uh, people didn't see you as having that value. Um, Of course, that was like a red flag to a bull Mm -hmm. at that point when they told me I couldn't get in. And so I went out of my way to tap every network I could find and every way I could find until I finally got in the door. Um, and then, as you said, I did spend very, I thought I was going for two years until Zach graduated. That was the goal. Um, and then I would probably go back to startups was the plan. But what I found was I thoroughly enjoyed Sun. I loved the challenge, the growth, the energy, the learning. And so I actually spent 13 years and, as you point out, went right through all of the growth stages, probably wrote it down too long. You know, I often joke that I failed the intelligence test. Um, If I have a fault and I'm going to blame the Irish in me on this one, uh, I'm loyal to a core. And, uh, you know, even when you could see the writing on the wall that things were changing, you know, I chose to stay out of loyalty to my teams at that point. It was a great journey. I learned a huge amount. And then when we did sell the company to Oracle, I, you know, was the spokesperson to try and get uh, the deal through the the all of the negotiations with the Department of Justice and then later with the European community so spent a lot of time in Belgium trying to get that deal um, to go through. So it was, it was overall a great experience. Yeah. And, you know, what's interesting about this is obviously Sun, by the time you joined, was a well-established tech behemoth, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Now you're operating in a relatively small company. So one has this massive infrastructure, and one, as you said, was two guys in a room when you when you started uh, working. Mm-hmm. With so, pros and cons: big company versus startup. Are you more a startup person now? That's how you think so. <laughs> it's almost like the hyphen question. You know, where do you put your Irish hyphen? Um, it's it is dramatically different. I have to say. Um, I am one, I'm told it's fairly unique, uh, and maybe it is the Irish in me again. I find I can do both. Um, I tend to approach both as if I'm, you know, 
on the track getting ready to to high jump or something ever you know i i clear everything else out of the way and look at the goal um and and so for me i'm able to look at what we have to do and grow and forget the bureaucracy or the size of the team around you a little bit i was nervous having gone through the growth at sun having you know like i said the door slammed in my face at first and then coming on board and going all the way through to being uh, you know, one of the most senior people in the company and having a huge team, you know, my life there was very much the admin sat outside the door and my calendar was handed to me when I went in in the morning and you, you know, you had meetings every, if they got you five minutes to run to the bathroom, it was a good thing. And then you go to a company where you have three people and, you know, you check your email a hundred times a day to saying it must be more complicated than this, right? Someone <laughs> must want to talk to me. And, uh, instead you have to create all that value yourself. You have to get people to want to talk to you, you have to put all of that heavy lifting in. I love both. I think there's ben- benefits to both, to be honest, Martin. I know you work in big companies. Mm-hmm. I think in big companies, you can find that excitement. I think you can find brilliant people around you and you can find the energy. That said, it'd be very hard for me to go back to a big company now. I think doing one, it's kind of like your family, you grow up in it. Doing one was great. Um, I don't see myself ever going back to big companies. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, the big company thing, I always look for more of a, and this is a very overused word, an intrapreneurial type experience where you're trying yeah. to, you know, attach yourself or get involved with something that has really interesting growth opportunities. Because if you ain't where the growth is, probably isn't going to end up so well. Right. But I think that's very true. And most people don't understand it, that you really can do intra entrepreneurial uh jobs um and you want to always be at that at that pivot point of a company you know to a great extent being at sun in the early days of java deciding you know i was pivotal to getting java on the phone uh at the pre-iphone you know this when we would go out and say phones are going to become smart and everyone thought we were crazy it was such a fun stage. And yes, there was a huge company behind it, but we were absolutely a startup. Same thing with open sourcing of Solaris and things like that. Um, the first cloud, you know, getting to be part of so many of these amazing things as part of a big company, they were still incredibly entrepreneurial. Yep. Um, so I don't think people should be put off by the size. They should look for the excitement, the growth, the passion you know, is it a, I look for courage. I always look for, is it a team that has courage and conviction and, and, and passion? Um, and if it is, then it's going to be fun to be part of it. So if you were to describe Sun's, let's call it Kodak moment, right? <laughs> um, let's dot the I and cross the mm-hmm. What led to some, I see it almost as, as a collapse. So, was it simply the advent of Linux? Was it cheaper networking options? What exactly caused it to contract to the point that Oracle was willing to pick it up? Yeah. You know, it's a much debated topic, and a lot of people have very, very different opinions on it, obviously. I would say that, um, in my opinion, the, Linux was a huge part of it. Um, the fact that we clung to a proprietary Solaris instead of opening things up sooner. The fact that we would only uh, work on Spark chips instead of adopting Intel chips, that was, to, I think, a huge part of the downfall when we we fought the whole Intel uh, commoditization to a great extent of chips, um, that the writing was on the wall. But there was also another factor, which was, you know, and it's ironic because uh, the building I worked out of is now owned by Facebook. It's now the Facebook campus. And the story goes, you know, they kept the uh, sun sign on the back of the Facebook sign. Still, it's, it's like a tourist thing down there. But if you go down, the sun sign is on the back of the Facebook sign. And Zuckerberg said at the time he was doing that and keeping various things from the old Sundays around to remind people to always innovate, that you needed to always stay ahead and innovate. The irony of that whole thing is, I think at Sun, we loved innovation if we suffered from anything, we suffered from a, we didn't want to grow up sometimes. We didn't want to pro, to, to productize. Mm. We always wanted to be on the leading edge in the software organization um, and didn't always think about, you know, exactly what does the customer need? If we had followed the customer more so, I think we would have adopted 
Linux or Intel chips. Um, in the earlier days, we would have seen that a customer needed both Spark and Intel, and we would have had a strategy mm-hmm. to, to be across all of the options there. But again, we wanted to kind of own everything and innovate on everything ourselves, and that killed us. Ironic now when you look at Facebook, mm-hmm. who, again, you might say, have not been great at listening to their customers and deciding what's practical and what's needed in order to give the customer what they need. And so to a great extent, I think you're seeing, you know, the Facebooks and even the Googles of the world, are, it's hard to stay always on top. It gets harder. Yep. So it's a cycle. As far as I'm concerned, it is a cycle. Well, people get very tapped into their cash cow. Um, and so they tend to see things through the, through those lenses. Um, well, let me back up a second. My take a little bit of, of it is, is Sun's cash cow kind of went away and you have this huge bundle of innovation that maybe you just couldn't bring to market fast enough to sustain the company as it was. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you always want to anticipate, again, listening to the customer, looking at the customer's needs and innovating. It's about finding the balance of those things. Because if you only listen to the customer, you're going to fall behind, right? You have to take what they're looking for and then find a way of innovating that into a new place. And we at Sun, we did cling. We did cling to our cash cow for too long, without a doubt. Uh, A company like Apple has done a great job, even though it's a proprietary garden and, you know, they're very guarded about, they're not open source and guarded about how they do their development. Um, Just the fact that they brought out you know, the iPad, which could have sabotaged their own laptop business, they were willing to do that themselves. And similarly, again, with phones and with different, the iPod and the phone, you know, they've always been willing to step ahead and innovate even when they own a category. And that's admirable. That's what keeps, I think, a tech company on top. That's, um, I think that's totally on point. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about you alluded to the fact uh, that when you tried to get a job at Sun, nobody wanted to talk to you. Mm-hmm. I guess part of that I, I, I will categorize under uh, techie engineer, computer coder, uh, pimply face snobbery. Mm-hmm. And part of it is um, maybe a certain hostility in a testosterone fueled environment uh, directed at women. So, how did you break that down? Can you give a little more color on that and, and then actually just talk to the issue of being a woman in tech in Silicon Valley and carving out a space where you're respected? Yeah, <laughs> it's a loaded issue and you put it so nicely. The, the, the you know quick answer is yes, Silicon Valley is absolutely loaded with uh you know, gender bias, without a doubt, I get asked that a lot. Uh, It's definitely loaded with tech bias. Um, But I think most places, to be honest, have something, right? And so Silicon Valley may be a bit more, a bit stronger in those directions. But what I found, so so I often look back at my early days when I, when I did get into Sun and I went to my first few meetings and, uh, James Gosling, the founder of Java, you know, I got exposed to him really early on. I'd be in meetings and he would be talking about his vision. And I was absolutely blown away by the intelligence of these people. I remember coming home and going, I've never met smarter people in my whole life. And then about three weeks later, because all I could do was listen at that point, you know, and try and learn. About three weeks later, I remember coming home and saying, I've also never met stupider not a word, but still more stupid people in all my life. And what I started to realize was that there was a massive, what I would call IQ bias in Silicon Valley, where we were very targeted at a very tech brain, tech-centric brain, but there wasn't enough EQ. Mm -hmm. Now I look at something that's very Irish. I think Ireland is a culture of EQ. And that doesn't mean we don't have great engineers and great technology programs and training, et cetera. But there's a fabulous core in the country where we've inherited it from the poets and the, the you know, authors of the past, the musicians of the past, um, where we have this, this creative and, and uh, emotional quotient, as they would say. Sorry if I wasn't describing EQ as emotional quotient. 
versus IQ. And so truthfully, Martin, I think I built my career in Silicon Valley in many ways, I would say bluntly, by being Irish. Um, I built it by being having high EQ. And so oftentimes when I was in meetings with these brilliant engineers, I would ask questions that sometimes they would say, that's a ridiculous question. And then they'd come back to me a few weeks later and go, you know, you made me think completely differently. So instead of stopping asking ridiculous questions when I learned a little bit more and I maybe knew they were ridiculous questions, I decided to keep asking ridiculous questions. Mm -hmm. And I decided to actually build a whole career out of being the balance to the technical genius, you know, pushing them and prodding them to think about things in all sorts of ways. So to a great extent, it wasn't about, you know, yes, there were barriers to overcome, but I felt like I found my, my niche, which was being uh, depending on the thing that was very innate to me, this ability to probe and ask questions and push on issues and get a human understanding of issues. And I became a compliment to the engineering teams that way. And then they started to embrace it and started to say, we have to have Ashling in on these projects. Um, so anyway, does that help? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's quite a profound answer in a way. So did you see yourself as being in the role or asking the questions that a potential consumer of a proposed product, you know, was going to ask and assuming that those people that were going to ask about the product weren't that technical, right? Right. Absolutely. And asking the questions that the consumer might want to, might not even know they wanted to ask, but probing, really putting myself in the position of the person who would eventually be using that technology and being able to think about what were the issues that they may or may not ask, but that they would, that would impact their adoption mm -hmm. of a product and, and really building that out. And when it came down to it, I didn't have a name on it, even though I had done my MBA, I hadn't put a name on it at that point. And it became, you know, the being product marketing and product management inside of these organizations and being that balance. Hmm. And building teams then after that that could see that how much that was valuable and then building teams of people who had higher EQ and who could balance the process, if you will. Um, it started to become a very successful balance, a very, very successful combination. And so, yeah, I started to, instead of, like I said, once I knew more about technology, once I understood the bowels of operating systems, et cetera, I could have switched and just become engaged at that level, but I, I really chose not to. And still till today, um, you know, with 25, 30 years of business experience, I will still go into something and try and play the role of someone who doesn't understand, someone who's, you know, try to think about the person who eventually uses this and what are the issues and challenges they will face. Yeah, it's a very kind of a customer centric focus and, and clearly necessary. Yeah. And it's something we're innately good at mm -hmm. in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I don't think we even have to think about it. Like I said, I had no title on it at the time. It was a natural process to go there. And I think it's something Irish people should be proud of and Irish people should leverage. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do think that there's something deep in Irish culture that spends a lot of time trying to get a read and trying to understand before necessarily taking a position on anything. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the legacy of that. I, I could theorize about it, but I, but I, I do think, yeah, uh, it's it's a, a superpower. Absolutely. But, you know, if you think about it, when we go into a pub in Ireland, no questions are off limits in this strange way. We'll sit down and we'll have the most raw, interesting conversations, things that here in America would be seen as politically incorrect or too probing. I, I think that the bar stool in a pub, that's, you know, we're willing to talk about anything and people don't take it that personally. It's literally like, what's your opinion on this? And I think it comes from there. Yeah, I think you're correct. It's kind of like that desire to connect at like a deeper level. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, we're connecting on multiple levels. And, and yeah, I think you're right. That's kind of a superpower. It really is. And so what I found was just by being me, just by being willing and, and there was a courage enough to be me because you, you did, you know, it was hard at first when they go, that's a stupid question. Um, so there's also, I think, a courage that is a bit innate with us. Um, 
you know, I often, and people who've worked with me have commented um, on kind of an inner confidence. And, you know, at some level, I always felt like I could go home. Like if it all fell apart, I could go home and nobody would judge me for not having been a success to a great extent. I could go home and people would just still be open to, to you and say, ah, great, you tried, you know? And so there was a tremendous confidence that came out of that, not an outward confidence. And people, again, who've worked with me have said, you have a huge amount of just inner confidence, just knowing who you are and knowing if you ask a stu- what's perceived to be a stupid question, that it doesn't impact, you know, it doesn't matter if people think it's a stupid question. You ask it and can keep pushing through. That, what I refer to now with people is kind of courage, um, that, that knowing who we are, again, very, very Irish and something I was able to use. And so to a great extent, Martin, you know, I used those things that were so innate to me. It was never about being a non-engineer or being a woman. It was just about really harnessing the things that were so natural for me to do and feeling like it was okay if I failed because I could still go home. Those were the things that allowed me to get ahead and build, um, a reputation again, not whether I was a woman or non-technical, but just building a reputation in the Valley as being just for someone who was, you'd want to have as part of your team. Mm-hmm. Now, in your role in Sinek, and, and you refer to the fact that you guys uh, do ethical hacking, and, mm-hmm. and it sounds like what I've read, um, you guys have teams that cross many geographies. Yeah, 82 different countries right now are greater than 80, maybe 85 now, but yeah, around that. Does the Irish thing help with that? You know, so it, so it's a little different, I think, than you're asking. So um, cybersecurity is a very s- sexy space to a great extent. It's a growing space. There's a huge talent gap is how we describe it in cybersecurity. When you look at the amount of products that are coming out, the digital transformation that has happened, and therefore the amount of security people you need to be able to test the code that's being released, the talent gap is enormous. So you could say it's a very smart industry to be a part of because there's just no lack of jobs. You know, it's for someone who grew up in a country like you and I did, where there was uh, high unemployment, cybersecurity is nirvana because there's just so much ongoing potential in the industry because it's growing so much. So for a lot of people, you would think that's why I chose cybersecurity. And of course, it definitely impacted my decision. But for me, the fact that we harness um, hackers from over 80 different countries around the world and the fact that it's a complete meritocracy, I think this goes back again to our roots. For me, that's why I joined. I love the fact that when one of our ethical hackers finds something we pay them, and we pay them within 24 hours, but we pay them based on the, the criticality of what they found. So it's very much paid on merit, if you will. We don't care whether you're in Arklo or Argentina or Atherton here in California. It doesn't matter where you're based. You're not getting more based on who you are or what education you have. You're going to get paid by how much you contributed, basically, the severity. For me, I am a huge believer in that aspect of the crowd. It also means that you could be sitting in the West of Ireland, you could be sitting in Connemara, and you could be an ethical hacker, and you could be participating in a very strong economy, making a tremendous living without having to leave your home the way we did. Mm -hmm. So I, I think those those aspects from the past, as much as I have loved my life and embraced and enjoyed every part of it, um, I think that the leaving was traumatic at the time. You and I both, that JFK, you know, it was, there was something that felt very final at times about it. You were very cut off, you know, we were back in the letter writing days. And I love the fact that now someone can participate and, and, and make a great living, but can stay in their hometown and can do that and can invest in family, et cetera. So the crowdsource component, the gig economy component for me is very, very important. And one of the reasons that I chose it. Excellent. So I'm mindful of the time we're coming up on an hour. So let me ask you two quicker questions. Mm -hmm. Um, You can tell now nothing is very quick with me. I'm still Irish. (laughs) That's fine. I I just don't know if you're you're running to anything else. So I don't want Mm -hmm. to in the the way. 
So first of all, um, inspiration. Uh, do you have a particular figure, an idea, a medium? Do you like to read? Do you like to listen to stuff? Where do you go uh, when you need to kind of freshen up on your ideas? Is there a particular book that you hold dear? Nope. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I have to say, if I have any trauma, uh, and I sound very, very Californian saying that, but from growing up was one of the things I struggled with a lot was the massive music culture. Like everyone loved to pick up a guitar in Ireland and play it. And I was useless. I had no musical talent. And, you know, I was hitchhiking every day from Greystones into Bray so I could, could go and find uh, a team to train with for my athletics. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so at some level, I think for me, I, it's not music. It's not literature. I, of course, I read loads and love to listen to music, et cetera. But literally life is the thing that charges me up. I am without a doubt, a, a, you know, an extrovert. I recharge socially. I find my ideas from living. Um, and so I'm someone who, if I'm not working, I'm socializing. I'm doing something. I'm out very, very family oriented. Uh, you know, I did marry a Yank, but he, he has very similar, um, philosophies Mm -hmm. in life to me. And so, uh, we live fully, if you will, you know, happy sitting on the, on the uh, bar stool then. (laughs) we socialize we travel we do a huge amount uh three kids uh all getting older now quiva ronan and finan um and so you know it's it's strange martin but i actually think i live a very irish lifestyle Mm -hmm. over here which i know sounds nuts um and my mom always laughs when i when i say that to her that the problem is i almost live in 19 you know 83 Irish lifestyle, which, which means I will, if any given time, still make myself a snake bite. <laughs> I kind of plateaued when I was 17. <laughs> and so, you know, I've, I've created my whole life over here to be very similar to my life uh, at home. I live between 25 and 30 miles south of San Francisco, having grown up living in Greystones, 20 miles south of Dublin. I live in a downtown, not a city like you, but in a downtown area. My American husband thought I was nuts when I said that we have to buy a house downtown Mm -hmm. so I can walk to get my coffee and the kids can walk to school. Um, It's that village concept. That's where I, that's where I recharge. Yep. Couldn't agree. Couldn't agree with you more about the virtue of a walkable space. Absolutely. And it's insane because you give up a lot to to do it. Um, But, you you know, we have a community. Mm -hmm because of that, you know, we, we know everyone in the town. It's funny. Mom comes over from Ireland and always says the day she arrives, she says, I won't shower right now. I'll go downtown. I'll walk downtown. Like I'm literally near enough. She'll walk off downtown. And she said, I'll, you know, go into a bakery and get a cup of tea and a, and a scone or something and, and get a bit of fresh air. And then every time she'll come home and she'll go, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, I met 10 people I know. (laughs) So literally, even though I'm in the heart of Silicon Valley, I'm in the, you know, my village, I think of it as a village. It happens to be the village that Facebook's campus is in. <laughs> so it may not feel like a village to many. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, my, mo- my mom knows so many people here. People will always say, when is she coming back? Um, I've really tried to recreate the life that I fell in love with at home and make it here. Okay. And then a final question. Uh, Let's call it the shameless plug. Uh, so mm-hmm. If people want to learn more about uh, Sinek, more about Ashling McRonalds, um, where should they go to, to learn about the kind of stuff that you do? Well, look, with Sinek, it's obviously easy to find us on, uh, you know, Sinek.com online. If you're a hacker, absolutely consider becoming part of the Sinek Red Team, our team of ethical hackers. Um, if you're... A business person looking at getting a start in Silicon Valley, I do a lot of work in helping people. Like, you know, I do find people who come through here who have an idea and they want to go and pitch for financing for VC money on Sand Hill Road. I live about a mile from there, and so I'm always happy to meet and have coffee and help people with their pitches or their presentations to help them get ready. I love to see the Irish uh, entrepreneurial economy growing. So happy to do that. I love to mentor students. Still, I'm still recently coached 
uh, athletics here. I've, I've just stopped that recently now as my kids get older, but um, always, you know, happy to help out and invest, easy to find on LinkedIn. Excellent. Listen, I'd like to thank you for coming on. I really enjoy this conversation. And of course, it's always a delight to catch up with an old friend. So Don't call me old, Martin. We're not that old yet. Uh, <laughs> we are getting there, I know. <laughs> there is a treasure in the mirror looking at me every day. <laughs> I see that one too. The good thing is our eyes are going fast enough that we can't tell. Wow. Uh, Martin did not let me get a word in edgewise today. Actually, I'm really sorry to miss this conversation. I do some work with cybersecurity experts, and I wanted to ask Ashling about the very first cyber criminals, the notorious TJX hacker and shadow crew. Didn't get that chance, but I heard the recording and I learned how Ashling's company beats the bad guys. And she also told us about an earlier employee's Kodak moment. On another episode of Irish Stew, we're talking to Jeffrey Hazlett, the former chief marketing officer at Kodak, and he can tell us about the actual Kodak moment. Ashling reminded us of the visa challenges young Irish face in the U.S., how the diaspora stays connected with WhatsApp, and she let us in on the Irish advantage, the soft power of the Irish EQ, the Irish emotional quotient. And she gave me a tip for the next time I'm in a pub in Ireland. I got to find out what a snake bite is. Thanks for joining us for another Global Irish Nation conversation. To see what we're stirring up next, follow us on Twitter at Irish Stewcast or like us on Facebook at Irish Stew Podcast. And you're very welcome to join Martin Nutty and me, John Lee, anytime for another serving of Irish Stew. Irish Stew is produced by John Lee, Martin Nutty, and Bill Schultz. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Bill Schultz. Music on Irish Stew was composed and performed by Rosa Nutty, with Donald Bowens on drums Kahalo Reardon on bass and synthesizer. For more on Rosa Nutty's music, please visit rosanutty.com. <laughs>